Well, I'm going to invite you this morning to open your Bible with me to the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. I need to give you a, a brief introduction by telling you that uh, this year, personally, I'm doing something I have wanted to do for a long, long time. Uh, those of us who went to Bible college, and that probably represents most of us in this room, uh, we remember, well, New Testament survey, Old Testament survey, and to be honest with you, I loved those courses. Uh, I loved just studying through the Bible in a survey format. I've always wanted to do one of my own, and that's what I decided to do this year. And so I am basically taking one book of the Bible per week, and I just devote all my efforts to studying, doing everything I can to get as familiar with that book in one week as I can. And it has honestly been one of the greatest Bible blessings I have ever experienced. I am absolutely overwhelmed with this study. But here's what I'm about to tell you. Last week was the book of Nehemiah. Does it not figure that this morning I'd be speaking from the book of Nehemiah? because it's been so fresh, so real, and I've always loved the book, uh, always enjoyed it, studied it through before, but this past week was such a great blessing to me. And so I'm delighted today to just say, let's go to the book of Nehemiah. Let's allow God to speak to us from this marvelous story. Uh, I, I did a, a podcast episode the other day with my 84-year-old dad, who's a, a former pastor, a lifetime pastor. And uh, we did it on Bible favorites, seven Bible favorites. And I think when we got to favorite Bible story, Dad said his favorite was Nehemiah. And so again, it's just kind of like, wow, it's all right there. Well, we're in Nehemiah chapter 1 this morning. And so I want you to just follow along with me in your Bible. I just want to read the first four verses of chapter 1 initially. Nehemiah 1, verse 1, the words of Nehemiah. By the way, this is interesting. Nehemiah's name means the comfort of Jehovah or Jehovah comforts. I thought that was an interesting insight. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time this morning trying to create the historical background, except to say that Nehemiah was a part of the horrendous collapse of Jerusalem. And he and the Jews, of course, had been taken to Babylon. Babylon has now been overrun by the Medo-Persians. And many years have passed. Cyrus, the new king of the, the Persians, had allowed Zerubbabel and Ezra to go back to rebuild the temple, to reestablish worship. Many years later, Nehemiah is still in Persia. He gets the opportunity to question what's going on in Jerusalem? What's happening with the Jews? He's concerned for his place. He's concerned for his people. Verse 3, And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity, they are in the province, are in great affliction and reproach. I circled the word remnant. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. I circled the word wall. And the gates thereof are burned with fire. I circled the word gates. Verse 4, And it came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Men and women, I want to share a few thoughts with you this morning in Sunday school 
about the subject of desperation. Hmm. We ask the Lord just to speak to us now in these moments. Father, it is such a blessing, it is such an exciting thing for me today to open the Word of God, to share it with these, my good friends, these fellow believers in Christ, this church. Lord, I'm just asking that today, in a very significant way, Your Word will be alive and real and genuine in its impact on our lives. Dear God, may we not just go through the, the routine, the motions of another Sunday school lesson. Rather, may we hear a word from God, I pray. We'll thank You for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Some of you are familiar with the video that I did several years ago on the Fulton Street prayer meeting that occurred in Manhattan back in the 1850s. Uh, I had for years studied it. I had the opportunity to come to New York City. Uh, a video crew came with me. We spent an entire day uh, filming the pieces to put together about an eight and a half minute presentation on the need for revival. And we based it off the Fulton Street prayer meeting. Well, of course, we were all over the city that day. It was a rather overwhelming day, to be very honest with you. We started filming early in the morning on the Staten Island Ferry and wrapped up about eight o'clock that night down in the lower end of Manhattan. And I remember having a little supper with the guys who had helped me. They headed back to Baltimore where they lived and I began my trip home. And as I'm driving the four hours back to my home in Pennsylvania, I was exhausted physically. I was mentally exhausted. I had never done anything like that and I discovered it was quite an, an incredible effort to do it. I was relieved. I felt we had done what we wanted to do. Now it was up to the guys who would do the editing and so on. So I had kind of mixed feelings, but as I'm driving along, there were three things, three images, I guess I would say, that just kind of kept flashing on the screen of my mind, so to speak. Three images from the day. The first was of a banner. In fact, there had been a whole bunch of them down in the lower end in the business district in the Wall Street area. It was an image of a banner that I had seen hung on the poles all over that area. And the words were simply these, the financial capital of the world. And I remember thinking to myself, hmm, isn't that interesting? With debt that goes into aliens that I can't even explain or remember how many zeros there are, we still claim that we are the financial capital of the world. Hmm. There was a second image that I couldn't get out of my mind and it involved the fact that the day we were there, all over Manhattan we had encountered SWAT teams on the streets. In fact, we were actually setting up to film a clip near the, the Federal Reserve area and had SWAT team members approach us in full gear, machine guns in hand, and of course ask us to make sure that the cameras were pointed away from any federal bu buildings and so on. And, and I saw that all day, everywhere, Times Square and, and different places. And I remember thinking to myself at first, wow, this city is more secure than I've ever seen it in my life. And I've been coming here for a long time, and then all of a sudden it dawned on me. Wait a minute. The day before, in California, one of those horrific 
mass shootings had occurred and many people had died on the streets of one of the cities in California and oh, all of a sudden I realized what a shame that now our streets have become so violent that they have to be patrolled by SWAT teams. The last image that kind of stuck in my mind involved two young women who got on a subway train that we were riding. Obviously, alternate lifestyle individuals, and they were bound and determined to make sure that everyone on the train knew exactly who they were and what they were all about. I'll refrain from being any more graphic than that. But to be honest, as I stood there just a couple of feet from them, kind of aware of what was happening, it was very troubling to me very unsettling to witness, to experience, and I guess as I was heading across I-80 that night, in the late hours of the night, that banner, those officers, those young women, those images kept going through my mind. And can I tell you what the result was? It intensified my passion for what my challenge to prayer for revival was all about. You see, not only did I have those images going through my, through my mind, but I had verses like, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. The earth was filled with violence in the days of Noah and God destroyed it with the flood. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. And I thought to myself, isn't it amazing? This very day, I'm filming a presentation on praying for revival in America. And yet, even as we've been out on the streets, I've been confronted by indicators that our nation very likely is on a collision course with Men and women, as I have done my Bible survey this year, and I've worked my way through at least a lot of the historical books, I'm constantly amazed that even in the book of Genesis, God established a nation through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and said, these are my people. But you know, as I made my way through Exodus and then through the Judges and then through the Kings and then through the Chronicles, and, you know what I became so overwhelmingly aware of? No one is the exception to God's rule. Not even God's own people. The very fact that in Nehemiah chapter 1 we're introduced to a man who is a part of a captivity, originally Babylon, now Persia. The very fact is an indication that God deals with His people even in their sin. And they will meet God either in revival or in ruination. It will happen. So we have this interesting story. Here is Nehemiah. He's given word about the remnant, the walls, and the gates. In my note, I put down this. The burdened remnant indicated that Jerusalem was void of spirituality. Do you know what I discovered? That word reproach that is used is used, I believe, four times in the first chapter or so of the book of Nehemiah. They were suffering. They were not doing well. At best, they were in survival mode spiritually. 
Secondly, the broken walls indicate that the city of Jerusalem was void of safety. An ancient city without its walls to protect it was very vulnerable to the attack of incoming enemies. Thirdly, I put down the burned gates indicated that the city of Jerusalem was void of security. Typically, it was those gates that kept in those who were to stay in and kept out those who were to stay out. But the security system was non-existent because the gates had been burned. Would it be safe to say that the report that Nehemiah received was a heartbreaking report? Those of us who are non Jews maybe do not understand in the same way the significance of the city of Jerusalem. But to the, Jew, the Jewish people, it was the, the holy city. It was God's place. It was the place where the temple had been. It was the city of David. It, it was of great significance because it was the place where God had been. But Nehemiah gets this heartbreaking report about the situation. Obviously, we're not going to cover the entire story, but it's worth noting that in chapter 2 and verse 17, Nehemiah had the opportunity to go and view the city firsthand. The king granted him leave. Chapter 2, verse 17, Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. He's been there. He saw it. He sensed it. He understood it. And, and it affected him. Men and women, There is no doubt in my mind, let's move ahead thousands of years, that once again in the nation we call home, the situation is desperate. But I fear that the church isn't. Hmm. In fact, do you know what my observation is? You know, you know, think about the last year in America. I, I don't need to turn over to Fox News or pull out a copy of USA Today to help me preach this message or teach this lesson. You know what America has experienced. And I'm not just speaking of the pandemic, but the political and the civil and the cultural and the political, all the issues, economic. But you know what I've discovered? I'm just speaking from observation. Do you know what I've discovered? Many Christians have almost adopted what I refer to as a talk radio mentality. We've become critical, sarcastic, opinionated, even comical at times when speaking of the very serious conditions that exist in our nation. Preachers do it from the pulpit. Bloggers do it in writing. Magazines, articles, radio. It's almost even Christians have approached it with this, this very relaxed, very casual, very comical, very complacent attitude. Really? I can tell you that Nehemiah got a heartbreaking report. But you only go to the next verse, verse number four, and you see a heartbroken 
response. A heart broken response. You see a man who sees, who hears, who feels, and his heart broke. Folks, welcome. We're in Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah experiences a significant response. What he saw moved him. Notice it again in verse 4. There are three things that are highlighted. Welcome. Come on in. We're in Nehemiah chapter 1. There are three things that are mentioned specifically. Let's, let's just look at them briefly. First of all, Nehemiah says, I sat down. You know, this is interesting. You do a little Bible study, and do you realize that in some of the most critical moments in biblical history, the instruction involved words like stand still or sit still or be still? Hmm. Isn't that interesting? You know what what we're talking about. You've heard people say it. Oh, don't just stand there and do something. Folks, this is going to maybe shock us. But do you know that sometimes, even in the moments of great crisis, God's instruction is, don't just do something, stand there. There's something significant about being still. One of the things that I see, and, I, and again, this is another whole lesson for another whole time, but if you were going to do a study on the leadership qualities of Nehemiah, and by the way, they're good, Ezra was the priest, uh, men like Hezekiah, I'm, I'm sorry, not Hezekiah, Zechariah, men like Malachi, they were the prophets. Nehemiah in this setting was the politician. He was the leader, the patriot. He's out front making things happen. But you know, one of the unique qualities you see, and you see it a number of times, is he was never impulsive or impatient. He took time to plan, to prepare. That's significant. But notice the second thing. Number two, we see that he says he wept and mourned certain days. I like this thought. Warren Wiersbe said, tears water the seeds of providence that God has planted on our path. Men and women, I like to think of it this way. Tears are the testimony of a tender heart. Do you know what I've discovered in my life? That which moves me to tears moves me. Can I just tell you that one of the great symptoms of our spiritual crisis in this day and age, even in the church, is what I often refer to as dry-eyed Christianity. I had the opportunity uh, last fall, actually, to I heard about a men's prayer breakfast. It was a Saturday morning at 7.30, and I thought, you know what? I ought to go. I think I'll go. By the way, if you remember last about November, some of these news items that I referenced were at a fevered pitch in November. I get to the church, walk in the building, and immediately I'm overwhelmed with the smell of cooking bacon and sausage, and I walk by the kitchen and the eggs and the pancakes and the casseroles and the pastries and the baked goods. Man, I'm telling you, they laid it out. So we got into it. Some of those guys ate a couple 
complaints. I can't do that in the morning. I had to explain to the Christophers. I'm, I'm kind of a, I got to start slow with it. Now, you want to feed me like that at 1 o'clock in the afternoon? I'm in. But I can't do that at 7.30 in the morning. But some of the guys, man, they just piled it on. Of course, we're sitting there. The, the tables are set up. You know how we had to do it all spaced out. Guys are hooting and hollering back and forth and talking and laughing and telling stories. And, you know, nothing, nothing wrong with it. Just a very pleasant, kind of a relaxed time. Eventually, we got done eating, got the tables cleared, kind of got the food put away. There was a, a brief scriptural challenge. And then it was mentioned that we were going to have prayer. Well, sheets were distributed to write requests on, and so we took prayer requests. By the way, I'm not being critical, I'm just gonna I'm just stating most of the requests given were the same requests that had been being given for months and months and months. Just keep praying, keep good. All very important. Then it's time to pray. And we divided up by twos, and then the two took the list and split it in half, and in about ten minutes, we had prayed through the lists on the, on the sheet of paper. And we were done. And I remember getting in my car to go home after I left. Good food, good friends, Good fellowship. Man, those are, the, those are the things that bring us together. Nothing wrong with any of them. But I got in my car and I started home and I'm thinking to myself, really? That's it? You know what dawned on me that morning? In the midst of all there was going on in our nation. Here's a group of God's men who probably function more like good old boys than men of God. Mm -hmm. Forgive me, I'm not being harsh here. But do you understand what I'm saying? Brethren, Sisters, listen to me. The great tragedy of our day is that the church is laughing its way into heaven while the world is crying its way into hell. And it's like it, it just doesn't even phase us. Oh yeah, it's bad. We know it's bad. Nehemiah was the kind of a man who was moved. And all he could do for a couple of days was sit and weep and mourn. No, tears are not the end in themselves. But tears indicate that something is going on in the mind and in the heart. Nehemiah was a broken hearted man. 